In this online lecture, we are going to talk about industrial strength proteins, or the basics of enzyme functions and how we use enzymes in biotechnology. So the basic definition of an enzyme is a molecule that acts as a biocatalyst. And so we're going to answer three things in the main part of this lecture before I talk about some specific uses of enzymes in industrial purposes, in biotechnology purposes. And these three questions are, why do we need biocatalysts, how do enzyme works, and what are the major classes of enzymes and how do they function? So a biocatalyst, a catalyst is something that instigates or drives a reaction to proceed. The reaction may have occurred on its own without a catalyst, but too slowly for cells to persist. In the words of physics, a catalyst lowers the activation energy for a reaction or a chemical process. And so if you recall from the basic physics or basic chemistry, every reaction that occurs, anything that occurs has an activation energy. So if to go to class in the morning or for me to go to work in the morning, I need a certain activation energy to get out of bed. <laughs> if I have a very exciting day, I'm going on vacation, I have a very low activation energy, but if I have, um, you know, kind of drudging through something I don't enjoy. You can imagine I have a very high activation energy and I need a catalyst, like a cup of coffee. It's the same with chemical reactions. There is this energy required for it to happen. And the catalyst, here are enzymes that we're going to talk about, lower that activation energy. And so uh, this process can occur much more rapidly. I want to just say a word about entropy and catabolism. Uh, the, the law of entropy is that everything is moving toward chaos and breakdown. Everything is, you know, molecules are randomly always shifting and moving toward chaos or toward restructuring. And so two examples that I think about a lot as a soil ecologist are lignin and cellulose breakdown. So lignin at the top is this very complicated molecule and cellulose is this very, very regular molecule of beta-linked glucose units in a long, long stream built together. And so under the law of entropy, over time, these molecules would naturally break apart. We wouldn't necessarily need to do anything to get this to occur, but it would happen so slowly that we would never, ever have enough of these molecules breaking down for life to persist. So we need cellulose, we need the carbon from lignin in order to build our cells. Our cells are also mostly carbon. We also need CO2 and to respire these molecules for energy. And so were we to wait around for th hundreds of thousands of years for this to naturally occur, you know, life could not persist. So we add enzymes into the mix here I'm just showing these as little Pac-Man figures, and they um, make these processes go much, much more quickly, you know, thousands of times, millions of times more quickly, so that we can get enough of this breakdown uh, to use as nutrients and for life to persist. So enzymes as super proteins. I'm gonna show this figure again, and probably this will not even be the last time I show this figure, but it's nice to come back to. So again, remember this basic process of DNA encoding genes. So DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. Um, this messenger RNA has codons. So each three nucleotides uh, are a codon that represents one amino acid. So those amino acids are then added according to this, the recipe of this gene into basically long strings of pearls in a polypeptide chain. So this golden chain at the top are these strings of amino acids that are formed from these codons and that form proteins. So these proteins are uh, not all enzymes, but a lot of them are enzymes. And if you look at this picture in a different way, we have inside the nucleus RNA polymerase. We have 
ribosomes. We have, you know, along this way, not even depicted several other kind of blob looking things that are enzymes carrying out these processes. So every step of the way we need an enzyme to catalyze and drive these processes to go quickly enough for, for life to persist. Another thing to note here is that the final protein, that big gold ball, is now you know, this big three-dimensional structure, and that's crucial to protein function. And so how proteins fold is something that actually, in some cases, we're still just beginning to understand. And so we are going to pause here and have a two-minute video to watch how proteins fold, how they go from this string of pearls into a formed protein or formed enzyme, because that'll be more effective from me um, just trying to describe it. I tried to embed the video, but the sound did not work well. So please take a break and go now and watch that video. So that was a video on protein folding and the three-dimensional shape of proteins or enzymes. So now we will talk about how enzymes actually work. So the, the way that we typically describe how enzymes work is a latch and key structure. So here in blue you can see our enzyme. That's our protein folded in a, in a shape here. It's just cartoonized in a little more simplified way. And we have an oxygen molecule and a glucose molecule that fit into this shape like a, kind of like a latch and key. So they fit in very tightly. And then as these substrates fit into the protein, the, the enzyme folds around them. So the enzyme folds around them, kind of forcing the molecules to come together and changing the shape of these molecules. So you can see the molecules brought into tighter space together, and then the latch is opened to release the products of this reaction. So here, the, the oxygen and beta-glucose are transformed into glucolactone and hydrogen peroxide. Um, the reason that I've shown this other part of this figure, this mix of various sugars, is to talk about the specificity of the enzymes. Some enzymes are extremely specific. So so for example, this beta-D-glucose is a subunit of cellulose, but you also could imagine an alpha-D-glucose, and that even has one different bond uh, in this molecule. It's a subunit of starch. It would not fit into this enzyme. That's how specific these enzymes are, one little bond. And so here's this picture again, uh, just to demonstrate the folding a little bit, I wasn't able to kind of easily find a video to show this folding. But again, the substrates fit into this area of the enzyme, and then the enzyme folds around them. And this part of the enzyme where the substrates fit in and then the reaction occurs and the substrates are released is called the active site of the enzyme. So the active site is what determines the specificity and determines the functionality of these enzymes. This is a really complicated figure, I apologize, but I wanted to just talk about Optima as well. And so this for this folding to occur and for these um, functions to occur, the enzymes have to be at a very specific temperature or a very specific pH. You can imagine that you know, pH, which is concentration of hydrogen ions or temperature, really changes this very intricate folding of these enzymes. And so um, orient yourself here to the thick black lines and the thin black lines. Again, I apologize for the bit of a confusing figure, but you can see the thick black line is the structure of TAC polymerase. This is a polymerase I talked about on Monday that was purified from uh, microbe living in deep sea vents. So it is, a, it is a DNA polymerase 
performing and elongating DNA molecules that can function at a very high temperature. The very thin line is attack polymerase from E. coli. E. coli is sort of our lab rat of microbes, and we know a lot about just about every aspect of E. coli. And so what you can see, the very thick line for the most part overlays the very thin line of these two different polymerases, but there's this one area to the right where the thin line and the thick line are separated, and that shows us that the folding or structure of these proteins is just a little bit different in this one place. Then you can also see the active site that mostly but not completely is the same between the two enzymes and so they these are two enzymes with the same function to polymerize DNA and so they mostly have the same active site but they have these little differences here and there and that completely determines the temperature optima at which these enzymes are functioning. The same occurs for pH optima so so an enzyme with the same function as another enzyme might have some little differences that allow them to function at different pHs. An example of this are phosphatases in soil. So there are phosphatases that, that um, depolymerize phosphate in the soil. This is a mechanism that microbes use to acquire the phosphate that they need for growth. And some of those function at very high pHs and some of those function at very low pHs. And it's this kind of very nuanced difference that allows that, that different optimization and different functionality. Here I've shown the specific temperature differences. So the TAC polymerase functions at 122 degrees Celsius in these deep sea vents, and the thin line operates at 37 degrees Celsius, which is approximate human body temperature, which is the native environment of E. coli. Now I'm going to give you an overview of the six major enzyme classes and their, and their main functions. These six enzyme classes are oxidoreductases, transferases, hydrolases, lyases, isomerases, and ligases. And for each one of these, we'll look at the product We'll look at the substrates and a little bit of their function. The first are oxidoreductases, and their main function is to oxidize one molecule and reduce the other. So here we have an oxygen molecule, and we have another molecule. We can imagine that this is beta D glucose. These are cartoonized molecules, but we will imagine what they are for the purpose of explaining the functions. And so the substrate would be this beta D glucose, and then it is oxidized into gluconolactone and with another product of hydrogen peroxide. And the oxygen in this case would be considered a coenzyme. So, so many enzymes need sort of helper molecules. So a helper molecule is either a cofactor or a coenzyme. A coenzyme means that the molecule is also changed in the process of this action. A cofactor is another molecule, often it's manganese or zinc or a metal molecule that exists in the enzyme, but it doesn't change. So those are the definitions of a cofactor and a coenzyme. And again here, this oxygen coenzyme is also changed. It's reduced into hydrogen peroxide and the glucose is reduced into, again, gluconolactone. So the next group are transferases. And these enzymes function to transfer a molecular group, or a, like a side part of a molecule, from one molecule to another. Our example here is D-glucose plus ATP. And 
in this case, the ATP has this extra phosphate side chain you can see in the gray ball. And these fit into two active sites of the enzyme. The enzyme again folds around them. And the resultant products of this enzyme are ADP, so diphos adenodiphosphate instead of adenotriphosphate, so it has lost a phosphate and that phosphate has been transformed to the glucose, which is now glucose 6-phosphate. So we're transferring a phosphate from one molecule to another with this transferase. The next class of enzymes are hydrolases, and these enzymes use a water molecule to break or cleave a bond in a string of molecules. And so here we have uh, a saccharose, which is a glucose and a fructose. And so it's a, it's a long polysaccharide that has two different sugar molecules, glucose and fructose, in the green and pink. And those fit into, in this case, a very complex active site into this enzyme with oxygen sitting in the middle. And then when this enzyme folds around them to create this reaction, the water molecule is used to actually break the bond between these two sugar groups and cleave them or so our substrate is saccharose. We use a, a water molecule, which would be, would be a coenzyme because it also is broken up in this process. And our products are glucose and fructose. These also happen to be my favorite classes of enzymes as a soil microbiologist because these hydrolases are major decomposition enzymes. They're used to break up cellulose, starch, I mentioned phosphatases. So these are really, really important when we look at biogeochemical cycling and nutrient cycling in the environment. So just a plug for my favorite enzyme class. The next class of enzymes are lyases. Lyases add a double bond, change or break apart molecules. And so this, this also can act to break apart molecules, but in a different way than the hydrolases. So here we see this kind of complex active site again with citrate sitting into this structure. And the this time there are no extra molecules used, but as the enzyme does its action, uh, the double bond formation of the oxygen on this molecule acts to break apart the molecule. Our next class of enzymes, our fifth class, are isomerases. And an isomer, if you remember from chemistry classes, is a molecule that has the same molecular formula, so the same number of carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, but they are in a different form. So it, essentially we're converting one molecule or one molecular form into another. In this case, we're using an isomerase, a glucose isomerase, to convert glucose into fructose. And this is represented by the six-ringed carbon representing glucose, which is converted in this enzyme to the product of fructose, which has five carbons in its ring and two side carbons. And then the sixth group are ligases. Basically, I've, I've described this as forming two molecules from pieces. And so again, we have our coenzyme here. ATP is the coenzyme because as you could imagine, it takes a lot of energy to build bonding structures and to form new bonds, to form new molecules. The example here would be DNA ligase, or when we talk about DNA polymerases, these are similar enzymes that will polymerize and add beads of the string to form long DNA molecules or lo other long molecules. And so the way that this works is that the two pieces we want to join together fit into the active sites of this enzyme. ATP, the energy 
concurrency of the cell is used when converted into AMP with an extra two phosphate groups to bridge these two molecules together. And so those are the six enzyme classes and just a little bit of a summary of protein function. Each enzyme has an optimal temperature and pH conditions. Some enzymes need cofactors, which are helper molecules. Some enzymes need coenzymes, which are helper molecules that also change themselves. Enzymes vary in their substrate specificity, and so we showed examples of very specific enzymes, but some are more specific than others. And also that there are these six major classes of enzyme functions. We're going to end this lecture with two examples of how we use enzymes for industrial purposes. And the first is an example of using enzymes more or less as we have discovered them. And the second will be an example of where we've actually engineered an enzyme to function better for us in industrial purposes. And so have you ever wondered how uh, corn that you see in the field it's converted into this pure, clear corn syrup liquid. And especially if you think about field corn that's used for this process, it's not the sweet, juicy corn that we buy to grill or to eat corn on the cob. It's this very tough, uh, less sweet corn, actually, that gets completely dried out in the field before it's harvested and sent to factories for processing. And this is done through the power of enzymes. So here is a figure from your book uh, describing this process. So first, which is not shown on this figure, we grind up the corn into just the raw starch material. Those much smaller pieces, of course, make this process work much better. And the first step is liquefaction through an alpha amylase. And the alpha amylase is a hydrolase, as we talked about, and so we add water to this mixture, but keep it aerobic. And this processor you know, breaks up those long starch molecules into subunits. And then the next step is a similar enzyme, glucoamylase, that breaks up those smaller subunits into single glucose units. And so we're going from a long chain to smaller pieces and now to only the glucose subunits. At this point we go through some filtration steps. So we, we filter out any um, extra impurities. We go through some additional purifi purification steps. We go through an evaporator to remove any extra water at this point. And then we use a third enzyme uh, a glucose isomerase. This is one of the examples I showed um, in the isomerase uh, cl enzyme class example. And this isomerase converts the glucose into fructose. And so again, an isomerase converts one form of a molecule into another. So it has the same number of carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, but now it's fructose, which is the desired form of sugar for this purified fructose syrup. So after that conversion, we go through some final cooling steps and have our purified fructose corn syrup. And so this is the first example where we use several enzymes to kind of do our bidding to make this corn syrup. And because of the use of these enzymes, this process actually has, has led to very inexpensive sugar that's put in lots and lots of products. I won't get into the health ramifications of this, but it's actually cheaper than sugar beets or sugar cane or other forms of sugar is this purified product from corn. So most corn that you see as you're driving along the highway either goes to feed cows or it is going to this process of making high fructose corn syrup. The second example, I'll come back to this figure of how a cell operates through tr transcription, translation, and protein synthesis, um, is that we, again, can 
re-engineer this process to make our own enzymes or to modify enzymes that we know about to do our bidding. And so here is an example of substalin, which is an enzyme that is used as a detergent. So it breaks up grease or stains or dirt off of materials. And the and you can tell here that in the mutated substalin, there is this one extra amino acid, which is shown as a red bubble in the active site. And what this does is it actually makes this a better detergent that's bleach resistant. And so now you can add an enzyme to the bleach. The bleach does not destroy the enzyme. And together you have a much more powerful detergent for, for cleaning just about anything, but also as household cleaners. And so the way that we do this is through the cloning process that we described on Wednesday. So we take a gene of interest and, and put it into a plasmid, into a cloning vector, and then we can you know, create lots and lots of changes or mutations in this enzyme and then screen for the ones that function the way that we want them to. And so the end here is that we have a better process with engineered substalin. We use less water, less energy inputs, and we generally have a much more efficient industrial process. And so just to give a summary of enzyme uses, enzymes can be purified and used to make large industrial processes more efficient by altering the genes for the enzymes through mutation and screening for better performing products, we can engineer enzymes to improve industrial processes, saving energy inputs and time. So here are your review questions, and there will be a quiz following this lecture. Uh, and then in class on Friday, we'll be playing a game to review the basics of enzyme function.